Let's begin reading here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And what I'll do is I'm going to spend the first introductory time in just verse 1. So we'll look at uh, chapter 9, verse 1. I'll develop and uh, work on this particular verse, and then we'll move through the, uh, the rest of the chapter. So, <laughs> excuse me, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 1. Solomon, Solomon writes, I considered all this in my heart so that I could declare it all, that the righteous and the wise and their work are in the hand of God. People know neither love nor hatred by anything they see before them. Now, Solomon has concluded something. He had stated that life is beyond comprehension. Notice verse 17 with me. He said, I saw all the works of chapter 8. I saw the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. For though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he will not be able to find it. So he said, life is beyond comprehension. There are many things that we can never expect to know. Now, he's already pointed out in the chapter prior to this uh, that life sometimes just doesn't seem fair. He, he pointed out that some people receive rewards in life that should be reserved for other people, for the righteous. It, it seems that sometimes the righteous receive less out of life than they deserve. So growing in wisdom helps us to remember that there will always be more to know. Um, some of you are familiar with the serenity prayer. How many of you are, just so I know, the serenity, it's very big in Alcoholics Anonymous, you just gave yourself away, and so, <laughs> I saw your face, John, you didn't want to admit it, but I saw you. The, ser the serenity prayer, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And so in essence, that's similar to what Solomon is saying. There are some things that no matter how long you may live, you'll never fully comprehend. And so these are the things that he's beginning to consider. That's why in verse 1, he says in chapter 9, I considered all this in my heart so that I could declare it all that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. People know neither love nor hatred by anything they see before them. I, I've realized that life just sometimes doesn't seem to be fair. So wisdom ought to be pursued. So these are the things he's saying that I gave my heart to dig through, to explain, to understand. So by doing, doing this, I have concluded that the wisest thing that I can do is to just trust the Lord. He says in verse 1, the righteous and the wise are, and their works are in the hand of God. Ultimately, our lives are under the divine control and supervision of our God. And though we may not understand why things happen, in the end, we can always trust God. You see, people know neither love nor hatred by anything they see that is before them, he says. So sometimes the good seem to suffer more than the righteous. So don't use outward circumstances as a measuring rod to show us the depth of God's love. You see, ungodly, <laughs> ungodly people can have good kids, good jobs, good marriages, and we can struggle. And that can provoke question about God's love for us. Or it can cause us to wonder if God is displeased with us. So outward circumstances don't necessarily reveal God's disposition towards us. Some things that end up good can begin as things that, that started out bad. And, and as Christians, we can see that to be true. I, I've shared with you recently that the, uh, the church in Galatia, as we've been going through the book of Acts, I've pointed this out, but the church in Galatia actually had an interesting beginning Paul first preached to the Galatians because of health issues. He said in Galatians chapter 4, verse 13, as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. So things that appear bad or start out bad don't always end up bad. Sometimes they can begin. The end is wonderful. You didn't know when you began through that cruel journey how it was going to end. 
And sometimes you might want to get to the point of just giving up, saying, God must be angry at me, or I must be doing something wrong, or I don't understand why things are like this. Lord, haven't I tried to, to please you? And, and you can go through that, and a lot of people do. And yet, God, God will use even those things that seem to be bad to produce something that is actually good. He'll see you through to the end. I was in a, a meeting. I was an assistant pastor in another fellowship, Calvary Chapel. And the pastor looks at me and he says to me, you're not a pastor. You're a counselor. I'm going to re remove your ordination. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your salary and cut it in half. You can go back to school and finish your degree and then become a counselor for this church. You're not a pastor. And that's how this church began. Because I said, there's only one thing that I know I am, and that's a pastor. It's just not here. So I gave my resignation, went home, cried in the arms of my wife, and here we are today. That's what happened. Just because something looks bad when it begins doesn't mean it ends up bad. Sometimes when our babies were born, they're so ugly. <laughs> but they end up looking okay. So God can use those things to strengthen us, to refine us. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of any kind or many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not like in anything. So don't be so upset as you go through the trial because the trial refines you and ultimately you become stronger through it. So something that starts out in a way that may look bad can very often end up in a great way because God is behind it. In verse 2, he goes on to say, all things, all things come alike to all. One event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good, the clean, the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice, as is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath as he who fears an oath. One thing happens to everybody. The righteous, the wicked, the good, the clean, the unclean, the churchgoer, the non-churchgoer, the one who takes oaths because he has a spiritual life, and the non-oath taker, the one who doesn't fear God. So this one thing, what is he speaking about? Because they says all things come alike and one event happens to the righteous and the wicked. What would that one thing be? Well, we know what that is. He's referring to death. Death is something that happens to all. In Psalm 89, 48, what man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? So we, he's saying, we share a common destiny. Both saint and sinner will die. And both saint and sinner are buried. So of all people on the face of the earth, looking from a Christian lens, we should have the greatest courage in facing death. We recognize its inevitability, and we're prepared because we know that it is the final enemy. Sometimes people have spoken of death as your friend. The Bible doesn't call death our friend. The Bible calls death our enemy. In 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed, he says, is death. Well, we're all aware that we'll die, but we can live with joy and not in fear. That's because we have hope that goes beyond the grave. Many years ago now, it's been probably, well, it was in 2001, I believe, so it's been 23 years or so, going on 23 years. Uh, I went to, uh, to Florida to do a, a weekend. I, I went to Miami on a, a Wednesday, and I was supposed to do the Wednesday night, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday was going to be doing a retreat and Sunday doing the Sunday morning service for the church, Calvary, Miami. And so on our way to uh, Florida... I started feeling my body, it, 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 there was, I knew that something was going to happen. I had lost my memory in the past, and as I was on my way, as I was flying, 
my body was telling me I'm going to shut down. So when we got to Miami, we went to um, our hotel, got ready. I went my, to Calvary, Miami that night. It wasn't Calvary, Miami. It was, anyway, we'll, we'll call it Miami. I think it was. Uh, I forget because I had lost my memory, remember? But anyway, because <laughs> there are two of them there, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the city. Kendall. It was in Kendall. And so uh, I like Cuban coffee. Mm. <laughs> but a certain kind. There's more than one kind, okay? Okay, I might as well go through the story. I'll, I'll go a little further. I've been trying to abbreviate it. Anyway, we, we, we've been to the Dunkin' Donuts there. We had what they ordered as Cuban coffee. But real Cuban coffee isn't what they gave me at Dunkin' Donuts. I'll say it like that. So I enjoyed that. It's like a cappuccino. Well, I tell my wife, honey, uh, get me a Cuban coffee. They were, and so we're at a church. That's, it's a Cuban church. And so she brings me two Cuban coffees, and I downed them both. Now, when I drink coffee, that kind of coffee, I don't sip. I bang it. Boom, it's gone. You know, that's what I do. Not realizing that these were like quadruple shots. Yes, I saw God. So, uh, <laughs> so, well, my blood pressure went through the roof. And as I was teaching the study, I, I lost my memory in the pulpit. I gave an invitation. I remember doing that. People came forward. I prayed with people. Marie walks up to me. She knows I lost my memory because I had gone through my notes and went back to the top and started again. She knew that. She'd seen that before. She knew I lost my memory. So she walks up to me and takes me by the hand. She's the only person I recognized. And I said, you need to take me out of here. I don't know where I am. They took me into the back. Paramedic was there did my blood pressure, it was over 200 and something, he said, he's going to have a stroke. They took me to the hospital in Dade County. I was there for three days, and really bad. The nurse came in, said something that was very upsetting to me about my health and this and that. It was a very bad situation. But while I was there, the pastor who had invited me to speak uh, wasn't, he wasn't around, but a pastor who was from that area, the uh, Miami church, uh, Raz Vasquez, came in to see me every day and took me on, you know, took Marie and me out to uh, Little Havana, and we had a real good time. I don't remember much, but I know I had fun. <laughs> I tell you all of this to say that when Raz and I said goodbye at the airport because he took, took us to the airport, I said, you may not like this, but you've made a friend for life. He was so kind and so loving and so good to me. Why am I telling you all of this? His wife died. His wife died on Saturday. And uh, I wrote him. And I said, Raz, I'm, I'm so sorry. I've heard and our love and our prayers are with you and the family. And he wrote back and he said, yeah, this is how Christians can be. He said, she beat us to heaven, David. See, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. One thing happens to us all. But the one who has Christ has hope. Because we know that our, our future is in his hands and he can be trusted and all. So we can, we can actually not have the fear of it the way that the world does. Uh, the Lord has saved us out of that fear because we know where we end up. We end up with him. And, and we have hope that's beyond a grave. You see, Jesus has conquered the grave. His resurrection provides hope and proof for us. In Psalm 49, 15, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. In John eleven twenty five 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Then he said this, do you believe this? That's the key, isn't it? So we can, we can be aware of the fact that unless the rapture happens, we're going to eventually taste of death. That is the last enemy. It's been conquered by Christ. But we have hope beyond the grave. We have a hope that the world does not have. He says in verse 3, 
This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. That one thing happens to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. There is an evil he speaks of. How do people react to the fact that they're going to die? Well, some live as if there's no tomorrow. Some sin and then sin and even sin more. They reject God. They live a life that is debauched. It, it, it is, is sinful. And, and then they die. They have no belief in an afterlife. They live as they please. 1 Corinthians 15, 32 he says, if the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink. Tomorrow we die. They just party themselves into oblivion. That's how some people deal with the fact of death. They just live as if there's no hell. But he says in verse 4, but for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. A living dog is better than a dead lion. That's an interesting thing. A living dog is better than a dead lion. Others just look at death as an obstacle. They they accept the reality of death. They haven't faith in God. So they cling to that saying, well, 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 where there is life, there is hope. They have no hope really for eternity. Uh, there's a, a man by the name of Woody Allen. He said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. And that's kind of how people are sometimes. Well, a living dog is better than a dead lion. While alive, the dog can still have an opportunity to improve its life, is the point he's making. And as great as a lion was in life when they die, there's no more opportunity, and that's the point he's making. He says in verse 5, The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And so the living on earth see death approaching. The living know that they will die. The living on earth can see death approaching and can prepare for it. There's an awareness, according to Romans 14, 12, that each of us will give an account of himself to God so they can prepare for it. But he says in verse 5, he says, but the dead know nothing. The living can prepare, but the dead know nothing. Now, that doesn't mean that their souls are annihilated. That doesn't mean that they go into some kind of deep sleep. Those who have died are reserved, ultimately, for judgment. Jesus gave a parable about this. It's called the rich man and Lazarus. He spoke of this certain rich man who lived a life of complete, of complete ease. He wore expensive clothing, ate the best of foods every day. There was a man who was poor, a beggar by the name of Lazarus, who was laid at his gate and would beg for the, gr the crumbs from this man's table. Well, they both died, Jesus said, the rich man going to Hades, Lazarus to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man is in torment. And as he's there in torment, he, he, he begins to beg for Lazarus to cool his thirst, to drop some water on his tongue, for Lazarus to cool his thirst with water. And Abraham says no. He said, in life you had your good things, and now it's Lazarus' turn. So part of the story makes it clear that certain things will exist after death. The rich man experiences torment and thirst and, ang and agony, and he also has memory. And he realizes that he has living brothers that are going to perish and go to the same place he is. So in death, he no longer had any hope for a better future because it's all over. So... The living still can have a hope for the future, but the dead can earn nothing, receive nothing, and even their memory is gone. They can't add to their reputation. They can't add to any reward once they've died. They're no longer walking on earth. They're unaware of the events on earth, and so the dead know nothing. There's nothing they can do once they've died. They're sealed in that. He goes on in verse 7 and says, Go eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already accepted your works. Let your garments always be white. And let your head lack no oil. So he blesses greasy hair. Interesting, right? <laughs> 
Since death is inevitable, instead of brooding over it, enjoy your life. Now, he's already said that. He said it in chapter 8 in uh, verse 15 when he had said, I, I commended enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry, for this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God gives him under the sun. He's already said, you need to enjoy life. He's already pointed to that. In chapter 2, in verse 24, he had said, there's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, that his soul should enjoy uh, good in his labor. This I saw was from the hand of God. Now, he's not encouraging us to go out and look for unusual experiences and all of that. What he's saying is, Enjoy the simple pleasure of life. Enjoy the eating, the meals. Enjoy the dressing, the applying of oil, which speaks of uh, festive occasions. Enjoying yourself with your friends. Life is to be lived at peace with God. And when you are living in peace with God, you have peace within. And when you see life as a gift from God, stress can be eliminated. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Being content with what you have, being content with the Lord, there's a great deal of peace in that. But striving to attain, striving to, to, to get something always, always trying to get, get something, well, my pastor used to say, if you strive to attain, you strive to maintain. It'll just have a life of strain. And so when you live at peace and being content with what the Lord gives to you, and it, that's just a very good place to be. He says in verse 7, God has already accepted your works. Now, when, he's, when he had pointed this out in verse 1 when he said, uh, the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hands of God. Well, to them he's saying, escape the clutter of life. Enjoy the simple pleasure. Somebody said, much of our activity is an anesthetic to deaden the pain of an empty life. And that's true. I, I've known quite a number of people who have been busy, 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 so busy always that they never enjoy the things they have. I went to Europe in 1975 for the first time. I spent three months there. I backpacked. Um, we went through a number of, number of cities. We had Eurail passes and Brit Rail passes and and we, went, we flew into Germany and then went off into Belgium and went off into Holland and went across to London, came back, went into uh, various other places. And so um, when we were in, in, uh, in Holland, my friend who uh, he had a, a, one of those, those tourist books that you could buy at the stores, you know, you know, visiting Europe on a dime or whatever, that kind of thing. And he had mapped off everything he wanted to see in Europe all the museums and everything. And believe it or not, some of you <laughs> might not, but and I was a hippie. For me, going to Europe <laughs> drink some tea. I don't want to get up and march around. We, we were walking nine hours a day. You know, and he had to see this museum, that museum, and and so I lost the, I lost the book that he had worked so much. I lost it. He got so mad at me that we were in Madrid, and he left me there, and he went off to Austria and left me in Madrid. I had the best time when he left. <laughs> I really did. I laid in bed. You know, I got up when I wanted. I, you know, I, I ran into him in Munich, Germany, after uh, seven to ten days of pleasure. I ran into him, and he learned his lesson. Um, and I tell you, I, I, I really understand what he's saying. Why don't you just slow down a bit and enjoy life? Why don't you just enjoy it? Why do you have to work so hard to gain so much stuff that you're going to fight to keep? And it gets old with the using. It perishes with the using. Before you know it, you have to get something else to replace that. And you forget that when you first bought that thing, whatever it may be, you were so happy the first week. And after a while, you got tired of it. Then you began looking for the new model. Just enjoy what you have. You know what? If more of us would do something like that, just say, you know, I'm happy with what I have. 
your life would be at mo much more peace. But if we're always straining to, to attain something, always working to get that, and then when we finally have it in our greasy little hands, it just doesn't satisfy. It really doesn't. What is he saying? Well, we need to simplify our lives. In Matthew 6, Jesus said it like this, verses 31 through 33. Therefore, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? The Gentiles strive after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and, and all these things will be added to you. He says in verse 7 and 8, he says, God has already accepted your works. So as believers, because we have faith in the Lord Christ and we're right with God, God has accepted us. He accepts the works that we perform on his behalf, works that are, that are prompted by the Holy Spirit. So instead of living a stressed out life, <laughs> enjoy the Lord, serve him, and be aware that he knows what you're doing and also that he'll reward you. In Hebrews 6 verse 10, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you've shown toward his name. In that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God doesn't forget. So realize that he's going to reward you. Now he goes on in verse 9 and says, Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, which he has given you under the sun, all your days of vanity. For that is your portion in life and in the labor which you perform under the sun. <laughs> Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. Hmm. Solomon had said people should enjoy life in the simple pleasures. They should eat, drink with joy and merry heart. They should rest in the grace of God. Again, enjoying simple pleasure inc includes enjoying your marriage. God has given you a wife. Love her completely. And love her in full commitment. I can go on about this one. This is a very important scripture to me, simply to live with my wife whom God has given to me. And, and I do my best to do that. I really do. Here's the thing. I, I feel that the simple pleasures in life are the things that have tied me together. And this I'll speak as a married man and all and perhaps... Perhaps it's important to say right now. Um, what is the most fun that, that I could have? And, and this can sound weird. I didn't prepare this. I wanted to just speak from my heart to you. So forgive me if it doesn't make much sense. And I'll do my best to make it make no sense at all in just a moment. <laughs> I've had a chance in, in the Lord. I, I, I've been around for a while. I've been a Christian for a long time. I've had a chance to travel and to see a lot of sights that, that, that many people wish they could see. I just have never realized, I didn't realize what a, what a gift that was to me. You know, I mentioned a moment ago that I traveled for almost three months through Europe, but I've traveled to a lot of countries. I've been to India, I've been to China, I've been to Thailand, I've been to South America. I've been literally around the world. I've seen a lot of cities. I've seen a lot of places. The City of Lights, Paris, Barcelona, Madrid, London, Edinburgh, Glasgow. I've seen a lot of places. Had opportunities to, to taste a lot of foreign food, some I wouldn't feed to my dog. <laughs> I really, really wouldn't. And then I've had some amazing dishes that I thought, this is just fantastic. So why am I telling you that? I'm telling you because all of those things that I've had the chance of enjoying and that were great. I'll give you one example. We were in Rome. My wife, Marie, and I were in Rome. And for, for two or three days in the morning, we'd get up and, and the guy in, in the restaurant, the cafe, would give us, bring coffee. And for, it was the best coffee we'd ever had. It was, just, I was amazed. It was, I said, this is good coffee. So I said to the fellow, I, the last day we were there, I said, listen, this is great coffee. Could you tell me the brand? Because I, I was going to go buy a pound of it to bring home. 
of course. He comes back in a minute. I'm saying, this, this is good. And I, he goes, sir. And I go, yes. He goes, the brand. I said, yeah. He, it's a, it's a called a Maxwell house. <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell house. I had to go to Rome to discover Maxwell House. See, so we've had a lot of experiences. But the most, and I can say that before God and you, the greatest pleasure I have is having a cup of coffee with my wife in the morning at home. Because, because that's the stuff that matters. We share a lot of memories. We've been together a long time. We've done a lot of ministry. We've gone a lot of places. We've been to Israel 29, 30 times together. We've been to Egypt. We've been to Jordan. We, we've been around places, a lot of places. But I'm always most comfortable when I'm enjoying the wife of my youth. That's what Solomon is saying. You don't have to travel distances. You want to go to Venice? Go to Venice, California. You don't have to go to Italy. <laughs> You don't have to. Go to Solvang. You don't have to. But enjoy. Because I'm telling you, one day it'll be the last day. One day it'll be the last day. So enjoy each day. Because one day it will be the last. And that's how it works. You enjoy yourself. And you make memories of the things that matter. And you share those things and you laugh with one another and you remember silly things and all of that. So he's saying, enjoy the simple pleasures. Enjoy your marriage. God gave you a wife, man. Love her. Be fully committed. In Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds what is good, receives favor from the Lord. Proverbs 19, 14, houses and wealth are inherited from parents. A prudent wife is from the Lord. So as is true in the case of so many, he didn't live up to his own ideals. He did understand marriage, but he forsook God's pattern at a certain point in his life. And he, he disobeyed God's rules concerning marriage. He had many wives. It seems that in his later years, though, that he embraced what he had once rejected. Remember, I've already shared this with you, but in the Old Testament, there was what are called the rules for kings. And in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 17, verse 17, speaking of the duties of and rules of the king, that the king must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. He did both. He had, according to 1 Kings 11, 3, 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. So enjoy the wife of your youth. Enjoy her. Love her. Invest in her. And the simple joys that you have, the simple memories that you have. One of the, and I'll say this quickly, I don't remember the movie. I never saw the whole movie. I just happened to be doing a channel surfing thing one day. I, I don't remember the name of the movie. John might remember because he remembers the story when I finish it. But there is a... Um, a scene in it, and I, I came upon the end, and there's an old man and his, his wife, an older man and his wife, and a Mexican couple, and they, I think we're in, in L.A. somewhere, very small, very small kitchen, and uh, it really moved me because um, I know that the movie was about some real tough times that he had had as a father with some sons that were problems to him. I knew the, the gist of that, but at the end of the movie, I'm looking at him, and I'm seeing my father because he looked like my dad. And his wife asks him, would you like some coffee? That was my mom. Every morning, mom would pour coffee for him. Every morning, she would make him his, his coffee. And uh, I'm, all of a sudden, I'm there in the movie for a second. And that's my, that's my grandmother or because it looked like my grandmother's house. That's my grandmother's house. That's my mom. That's my dad. And I know he's gone through a lot of garbage, and he looks at her after she gives him coffee and sits down, and she, he says, <clears throat> we've had a good life, Mama. And she says, yes, Papa, we've had a good life. And I know they had a hard life. And I cried. That was my mom. 
and that was my dad. That was my grandmother and my grandfather. And that will be me. Well, I'll look, and I do. I'll turn to my wife, and we shake our heads together. We've had a good life. God has been good to us. Why? Because we've kept him in the center. And that's how you have a good life. And that's how you enjoy the simple things. That's a fact. So you love him. You serve him. And, and, and he works in your life every day. And we serve him with everything within us. That includes everything, the work that we do, the school that we attend, the marriage that we have. Life in general is for him. In verse 11, he says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not for the swift, the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. But time and chance happen to them all. A man also does not know his time like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare. So the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. So the race is not to the swift. So he's thinking of, 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 of death, and, and his, he realizes life can be unpredictable. Some think that since death is unavoidable, just concentrate on living at least when we die, we'll be able to look back and say, look at all I've achieved. But that's not true because you can't guarantee what ultimately happens in life. Life itself can sometimes be very unpredictable. So he's pointing that out. The fastest runners and greatest warriors don't always win. Upsets happen. Athletes may lose based on poor judging, injury during a contest, stumbling while running or not preparing for the race. A warrior can lose by not training properly. An illness, a lack of concentration, underestimating their enemy. All of this can be an upset. He says, nor bread, verse 11, to the wise, riches and men of understanding. Even the wisest people can go hungry and they can experience sudden poverty. Those of understanding, the word understanding speaks of skills, can lose their jobs due to downsizing. They can be injured. Sometimes they're overlooked because of favoritism. So Solomon says time and chance happens to them all. Sometimes things don't go according to our plans. Things can happen that we have no control over and our plans are undermined. When he says time and chance, he's not speaking about what we call luck. He's speaking of unforeseen circumstances. We trust God to help us. We make decisions. We rely on him. In Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know the way of man's not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. I know that we have to, to follow you. I know that you have, have ordained a path for us to walk. We trust in you with all of our heart. We're not going to lean on our own understanding. and all our ways, we'll acknowledge you. You will direct our paths. So he says, you can't know what the future is, so you trust the Lord who does. He says in verse 12, a man does not know his time like a fish taken in a cruel net. No matter how detailed my plan may be, there are things that come unexpectedly, like a net that captures a fish, a snare that catches a bird. And sometimes events occur beyond our control, and we're caught by them. Life is out of control, our control. So I submit to the will of the Lord. In verse 13, this wisdom I have seen under the sun seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it, besieged it, built, a great sna built great snares around it. Now there was found, found in it a poor wise man, and, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no one remembered that same poor man. I said, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom's despised. His words are not heard. Words of the wise spoken quietly should be heard rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. One sinner destroys much good. So he begins to use an illustration here and closes. He's showing something that's unusual and very common at the same time. It shows how the battles don't always go to the strong. So he gives a story. There's a powerful king, he says. He comes against a small, sparsely populated city. And the mighty king lays siege to the city using his military strength. 
Though heavily outmanned, the city is delivered by the counsel of a poor man. Now, because of this, the man should have been held in honor, remembered, but he wasn't given proper honor. As a matter of fact, it was forgotten. So he's pointing out that human honor and fame don't last. Honor gained from man doesn't last. So if you're going to seek to be honored by anyone, desire to be honored by God. In Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each, let each esteem others better than himself. Sometimes we do things even in ministry to be seen by man. And Jesus spoke about that. He said some people give, some people pray, some people fast. He says all to be seen by man. And from man they receive their reward. So the thing that you do, you do in your own spiritual closet between you and the Lord. The things that you do are for him and to him. And the one who sees in secret rewards you openly. So there are people who do things, and they, they might have great success. They, they push themselves. They're up in the front. Their name is known. Even in ministry, this can happen, where pastors desire to be known so desperately. They do almost anything to be known. But the problem is they got the reward by the attention they receive from the people who speak to them. He says in verse 16, wisdom's better than strength. Wise men are often ignored because they don't draw attention to themselves. So, in verse 17, wisdom is to be preferred over the shouting of a fool. <laughs> What's that mean? Well, loud and obnoxious people often get attention and the glory they don't deserve. So, we should look to those with a quiet wisdom and respect them. Wisdom, he says in verse 18, is better than weapons of war. Using wisdom can produce great good. It may lead to victory and peace. Listening to one who is driven by sinful foolishness undermines what is good. So be careful. Be careful whom you allow to give you counsel. There are a lot of Christians that I see on social media who perceive themselves to be great Bible teachers and counselors. And so many times I've read some of the counsel or some of the biblical study or teaching or comment that they make, and I say, nope, that's not what that scripture says. You know, James told us to be very careful not to desire to become a teacher because we receive stricter judgment. The things that you say will be held and, and weighed by the Lord. So you just don't open your mouth like you're, you know, Moses on Mount Sinai declaring the wisdom of God to man. When you, when you share in his name, you're very careful to be correct to the best of your ability. And sometimes a loud person gets more attention and is listened to more than the quiet one who's musing or thinking through what's being said. So a long time ago, let me give you a basic thing. We'll close. A long time ago, I made a decision to be like my father in one thing that he did. My father was a quiet man, and he never just spoke. He would not give advice unless asked. And I learned from him because whenever he spoke, people would respect him and listen. My dad was wise enough to listen to the conversation that was going on around him to weigh through the things that are being said and then ultimately come up with a solution that would be good for all involved. That was my dad. And I became like that myself. I will listen and I'll think and others will be speaking and I'll think. And then I'll ultimately be the last one, if at all, to speak because I've had a chance to hear everybody else. I can put all of these things together, and then I can say, well, this is probably the best seeing these are the things we're dealing with. So be careful. Be careful who you allow to give you counsel. Make sure that they're believers. If you're going to receive their counsel, may they be knowledgeable with Scripture. If they're going to be your counselor, may they, may they be mature in their walk. May they be respectable in their life. And if they're going to be your counselor, may they be willing to tell you the truth, even if it bothers you to hear it. 
Faithful are the kisses of a friend. When someone loves you enough to tell you the truth, that's a real friend. If they tell you that in love. There are some who like to tell you things because it hurts you. That's not a friend. But there are others that it hurts them before they even tell you. Because they see it. That's a friend. Because they'll tell you the truth. And in this world where everybody's willing to lie to you, it's valuable to have a God-fearing, God-loving friend who will tell you it's true. We really need that today. In Psalm 1, it says it like this. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or set foot on the path of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He meditates on the law. And that's what gives him wisdom. And that's why he's blessed. Keep that in mind.